an official start. Thank you all for coming back again today. Um, we have a, a really great speaker. Uh, as Pastor Megan said this morning in church, uh, we're blessed to have experts in our midst. And Maurice is one of those experts in Spokane on homelessness. And uh, as you as you heard last week, he's been immersed in it for quite a long time and also has personal experience with homelessness. So we'll go ahead and get started where we left off and you can begin again. Okay, yeah. Just a, a brief introduction, and uh, you're getting my frog voice this morning. My, we've been through this pandemic, and my sign of normalcy is I'm getting my normal spring change of weather cold. And it starts in my head, my throat, and so I'm going, finally, something normal. <laughs> never thought I'd be excited about having the cold. Um, what we're going to take a look at this morning, in the last half of the documentary, um, we're going to take a look at police sweeps, and I, I've filmed numerous police sweeps. I uh, think you'll see what a police sweep looks like. And then uh, legal commentary on it. And then as we were putting it together, I realized what one of the things that we're missing, we do a lot of shouting at each other, left versus right, conservative versus liberal. Um, that's the polarization that's taking place in our society right now at every level. And one of the things that we desperately need is a community conversation where we talk rather than shout at each other. And so I thought, well, maybe one of the ways that we can do that in the documentary was to get some experts in particular fields and just let them talk. And so you'll see uh, Council President Rian Dex. Um, you'll see Sean Vesta from the Spokesman area. Sean's a friend of mine. And uh, he calls me when he's working on the story. He says, what is going to be And so he's, he's, he's fishing to see if I know something he doesn't know. But uh, we have a good working relationship. And so I called him and I said, would you be able and willing to do a documentary interview? And I told him to say no. Um, he said, I want to. He went, oh, I think hell just goes over here. It's one of those <laughs> <laughs> surprise moments where you kind of get caught off guard. So, oh, that's great. So anyway, you'll, you'll see some of these folks in there. And all of those folks that you see, um, I, I pose some questions to them. Um, you're only getting a small portion of their interview because it, uh, they could consume the entire documentary. And, they, and it was a great setup. So all of these interviews are posted on our website at myroadleadshome.org. And so you can go to the website and you can see all of these interviews in their entirety. And uh, I was absolutely blown away by some of what I heard. I was hearing it for the first time. I just went, wow, our community needs to hear these kinds of discussions. From We're not shouting at each other. We're not yelling at each other. We're not arguing with each other. We're just, you know, Sean Vestal saying, you know, I understand what business owners are going through, but I keep telling them the police can't do that. And you just, you hear these normal conversations, and that's what we need here. So anyway, that's, that's what you're going to see this morning is uh, the section on police speaks and then going into the community discussion. And if I stop talking now, we might actually have some time at the end of the question. Let's go ahead. We need a better and a different path forward. What if it looks like a mess? Oh, God. We could fill a complete documentary with footage and stories of law enforcement sweeps of homeless camps, forcing people to move on with nowhere to go. And perhaps at some point we will. But for now, I simply want to humanize the reality of all such sweeps and to ask questions about their effectiveness and even their legality. In the previous segment, we established that the city of Spokane doesn't have either enough shelter beds or the right kinds of shelter beds for those struggling with If that's with true, and it is, then what's the purpose of law enforcement sweeps? And what about the trauma and collateral damage that such sweeps inevitably create? Unfortunately, law enforcement sweeps of homeless encampments like this one have become daily events with personal belongings being tossed into a city garbage truck. In the process of this sweep, one individual was injured when his hand was run over by a city garbage truck. It's time to ask ourselves, is this the best we can do as a city to serve those in need? 
Our current policy in Spokane of conducting police sweeps of homeless really fits into a very long historical narrative uh, throughout the country of using the police power of the state to try to rid the, us of undesirables, whoever they might be, you know, whether it was day laborers or migrant workers, the poor, uh, minorities, um, whether they be racial or sexual or otherwise. Um, we have a long history of trying to solve that problem, as we see, with force, with criminal sanctions, with police, with jail and judges um, and punishment. Um, and our history is very clear that it just doesn't work to meet the goals that we might have and it's inhumane um, and never goes to the root of the problem. Uh, it's just maybe it's the easiest fix that one can reach for. We have these police already here and they can use force and we can get an immediate, uh, by, by morning this area will be clear, um, but it doesn't do anything for the long run. It doesn't solve the root causes. If you move someone from the street for a day, where do they go tomorrow? And then it just shows um, a lack of, what's the word I'm looking for, um, empathy and I think the problem solving that we need to say if we really want to solve this problem for our sake, if, if not for the other person's sake who we're um, frustrated with, we need to figure out what the, what the root cause is. Let's take a look at a law enforcement sweep of a homeless encampment outside of Citygate in downtown Spokane in late January of 2021. Daytime temperatures were below freezing, and all of the shelters in the city were full. Once the police realized that we were filming, they went into full PR mode, lecturing about their experience and understanding of homelessness. One person in the audience was not impressed. Gabrielle Pizarro had just received a citation for obstructing the sidewalk with a piece of cardboard. This wasn't my first encounter with Gabby, having interviewed her three months earlier in October of 2020 on this same spot for a documentary short piece I was doing called And Justice for Some. I've chosen to feature Gabby's experience because it highlights six themes that are common among the homeless who are being swept. My name is Gabrielle Pizarro. Tell me about your journey into homelessness. What got you started and why are you on the street right now? I lost my son. Uh, he passed away from SIDS. Um, I had uh, been here since I was for 10 years and uh, I was an alcoholic as well and um, kind of lost myself, lost my home, got a DUI and my family didn't know how to cope with it and so I didn't have any support and uh, I just kind of fell out here and uh, one winter turned into two and I'm going on two and a half years. It's disappointment when you get told that you're too overqualified or that there's a list and it's months and months and months long um, and there's nowhere for you to go and you're getting kicked off of every block. You can't sit anywhere, you can't carry a backpack, you can't use the restroom. Uh, it's just really discouraging and, and over time you just kind of give up. Um, and I'm not one to give up but I've, I've lost hope, I guess, um, with, with the ha not having options. There was a morning where I was sitting down in a parking lot um, to fix my pant leg, it was snowing, um, to fix my pant leg and tie my shoe. Um, and nobody was around me and I had been informed by the cops to um, to be arrested sitting in the back of the car for I didn't know what but they they cited me for trespassing in the second degree when I was tying my shoe and um, I, I was in handcuffs in the back of a car for about 45 minutes um, as they were in, interviewing two other people and that uh, had been arrested as well for other charges um, I was uh, issued community court and have uh, eight hours of community service to complete in order to have my um, ticket drops, but I was cited and arrested for no trespassing for time issue. So tell me where yeah. you're staying now. Under the tunnel. I'm currently homeless and I have a sleeping bag and a backpack that I take with me to sleep underneath the tunnels um, at night when the weather's terrible like it is now. Um, I use cardboard boxes and the blankets that I have. So this year I've learned how to camp out um, in the trees and uh, with a hammock <laughs> um, and in tent, um, but constantly having to pick up and move and hoping to not lose my belongings. Um, currently, I am underneath one of the tunnels um, at night. Um, usually kind of get close with other people um, with cardboard boxes and the link is for you to share them and keep body heat together. And uh, it, it's rough because you only have so many hours a day that they allow you to sleep without having to worry about getting sighted and or losing your stuff. And, and uh, 
picked up and thrown away. And one thing the Boise decision did was it made people realize that people were being arrested for being homeless even when the shelters were full. I think a lot of people didn't realize that we had shelters that were over full and that there, people literally had no place to go. Um, and since most community members don't like having a city where people have to camp outside and they thought there's an easy solution that they can go to shelters and they realized, oh wait, there's actually a situation where there's more people than we have room for, we got to start investing more in that room. And we also have to think about, hopefully, how we respond um, when we want someone to not be on the sidewalk. Should we respond with the police or should we respond with a homeless outreach team that provides resources? Um, because I think we all just were forced to confront a problem that we had really worked hard to ignore for a long time. And a decision like that, its real main power is simply to make us, hopefully, talk and think about these problems and actually invest some resources in fixing them. You're about to have a brief but meaningful encounter with Shell. I first met Shell and his wife Tanya, who suffers from MS, almost a year earlier while filming a large homeless camp north of Spokane, where they were quietly living in their camper trailer. That's Tanya, second from the left in this outreach picture. But on this day, in June of 2021, they were caught up in a sweep of camps along the Spokane River. You just lost your home? And your truck and your camper. I just asked if you had a place you wanted to go. He said, yeah, I just want to right now. So how many times have they moved you here recently? Five. Right. Five So how does it make you feel? Totally lost. This sweep of homeless camps along the Spokane River took place on the hottest day on record for Spokane. At the time of the sweep, between 11 a.m. and noon, the temperature was already 100 degrees, and it would peak out that afternoon at 109. Shell's wife, Tanya, was taken into custody for medical evaluation, and their camper truck and only home were impounded. And Shell, now actually homeless thanks to the city of Spokane, was told he could go to a cooling center. Really? Isn't it time to ask ourselves, is this the best we can do as a city to serve those in need? The playlist of stories from people being swept and forced to move with nowhere to go is longer than anything we can cover in this documentary segment. But we do want to meet and hear the stories of a few more real people. It's how we humanize the impact of this misguided policy. Now, I've been told more than once, that there's more to so-and-so's story that you didn't include. This is true. But people experiencing homelessness seldom if ever have the opportunity to tell their story in their own words from their perspective without it being filtered by police, courts, or even agency caseworkers. In my documentaries, I try to allow people the space to tell their own stories and by doing so to participate in their own journey of personal discovery and self-healing. Meet Amy McCain a Montana girl who's been homeless off and on in Spokane over the past five years. I interviewed Amy on August the 19th in a homeless camp near Ironbridge in Spokane. Would you talk to me about your most recent experience or two of being asked to move on? You're currently homeless, is that correct? Yes, I am. And can you tell me about any recent experiences you've had where you have been forced to move? Uh, well, uh, there's been several occasions actually in the last five years. Um, I have been visiting even friends who were camping and stopped by their camp and um, was treated as though they didn't even listen to me. The cops uh, came in and, and my friend wasn't there, but I got the ticket and uh, lost everything. Um, ID and purse and makeup <laughs> and uh, anything to you know that would maybe help me like if I got any numbers gathered up to, to get a job um, they were gone they made me leave my stuff on the sidewalk one time because um, I had a warrant for that time for being in the 
camping unlawfully on public property, way out by High Bridge Park. <laughs> Let's meet Debbie Hall. I've actually followed Debbie through several homeless camps over the past year. I recently caught up with Debbie outside of Liberty Park and asked her to tell me about her recent experiences of being forced to move. Where are you camping right now? Right now, I'm right right above Liberty um, Liberty Park um, on 3rd Street. And where were you before you camped here? I was up 3rd Street Hill, across the street from Ramada, and right behind um, Costco Hill, but across the street from Ramada. And uh, yeah, right there. And what what happened that you had to move from there down here to where you are right now? The cleanup crew and, and the cops came, told me it was private uh, property, and I had to get off there and move. And that if I didn't, then I would be, I'd be arrested. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, they say it's trespassing your private property. How long ago was that? Um, I was up the hill. It was about almost two weeks ago. I was over here, maybe not even a week. And they came, and then they came back. I, I didn't, I didn't leave. I was packing. I didn't leave. And they brought the cops. They came through um, the day before yesterday and told me I, I, that if I didn't move, then I was going to be arrested. And um, I, I mean, I moved this far. I've been here a day and a half now since since they've been here. And, but this, yeah, this is pretty cool. <laughs> and what has happened to your property in these two moves now? I've dwindled it to almost nothing. I mean, they, between what they take and uh, what I can grab, I, I've lost um, a lot of stuff. I mean, I've lost my bedding, I've lost clothes, I've lost blankets, I've lost tarps, um, you know, uh, food stuff, uh, you know, food stuff that we eat, you know, they, uh, they, they don't care, they just they take it all. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I've lost, I've lost important papers that I actually needed to get my ID, which will help me. Um, there was um, papers in there that I had for the IRS, and uh, I mean, they're they're not going through it and saying, hey, listen, oh, maybe she might need this. No, they're just grabbing it and considering it all garbage. You know? yeah, pretty, uh, yeah, that's those are the papers I need now. I have to get back a hold of the IRS and have them mail me papers again, and and that's just to get my ID. Say hello to Russell Rust and his wife Jamie. I met them behind a fast food restaurant after they had been sighted and swept from Mission Park. I asked Russell to tell their story of being sighted, a very common story in the homeless community. Uh, yesterday, approximately at 11 o'clock, uh, me and my wife were asked to leave Safeway's uh, premises. And so she's seven months pregnant and we walk over to Mission Park and get there. and. As soon as we lay down our blankets to rest for a little bit, a police officer rolls up, comes up and asks us for our name and everything, so we give it to him. And then we get cited and ticketed for a Safeway cart that was holding our stuff. And that was, and, and then we're kicked out of Mission Park for six months. And I don't think it's fair at all, honestly, because we didn't do nothing wrong. Finally, meet Chancey Lee. I arrived to film in Coeur d'Alene Park just as the police were finishing up, telling Chansey that if he didn't move on, they would impound his truck and arrest him. But I'll let him tell his own story. How long have you been here in, um, in Coeur d'Alene Park? About three or four months in and out. And are you, uh, you're, you're leaning against your truck there. Are you staying in a shelter in your truck? Where are you staying? I live in my truck. And where were you? living before you came down here to Coeur d'Alene Park? H.O.C. Uh, the other one is uh, Union Gospel Mission, but they won't let you totally stay there either. So at this point, there's no place for you to stay, is that right? No. You just got they. Everybody leaves here, they'll go make their own spot. And then eventually everybody gathers together, and that's how it winds up looking like this. Okay, if you were up at uh, HOC in that area, uh, why why did you leave? Uh, police and was told to. Because you can't, they don't want you camping. They say, no camping, it's flat. There's no other place to go. So you came down here, and what happened here yesterday or today? They just, you know, they show up, they ask you to, you know, they pull your name and then they just, Say it's time you got to go, or you'll be arrested. And that's what they told you? Yeah. They said, well, me, they would impound my truck and arrest me. And I'm in and out down here. I hardly even, I sleep down here a lot in the streets, but I don't sleep in the park. And it's nice to have this park because it's got water. There's no water in Spokane to be had. You cannot go into bathrooms and 
like you used to. And down around HLC, it's really, really bad down there. Because there's no water, they will not let you in the building at HLC unless you spend the night. It's quarantined off. They got big steel gates around them. That's a shelter. It's really unfortunate. I think that there's so many better tools available. They are usually less expensive, more humane, um, and uh, more long-term. The thing is, we need to have all of us invested in that. This is the other tools that we might need, um, like funding, like places to go, community support programs, treatment, housing, require political will, community will, financial commitment, all the things that um, are a little bit harder to do and take more time and attention. Whereas if you give it to the police, that's their problem. They'll take care of it. Don't think about it anymore, out of sight, out of mind. Um, and I think that's where the main disconnect is. As someone who's worked among the homeless and marginalized of our city for over 15 years, I believe law enforcement sweeps of the homeless offer the most tangible and visible evidence of a failed homeless policy or the absence of any actual policy at all. If sweeps were effective in solving urban homelessness, the city wouldn't need to do them on a 24-7 basis, which is what's happening now. But it gets worse. Such ineffective sweeps offer compelling evidence of an undeclared war against anyone experiencing homelessness on the streets or in the parts of our community. Homeless individuals are being openly told that there's no place they can legally go and camp. In other words, their existence is illegal, outside of a shelter or jail. Because the city is legally prevented from citing the homeless for violating sit and lie and no camping ordinances due to a lack of sufficient shelter beds, law enforcement is increasingly citing the homeless for other things, such as third degree possession of stolen property. What property? A shopping cart. They're also being aggressively cited for obstructing pedestrian traffic, as we saw with Gabby Pizarro. Municipal courts are overwhelmed with the volume of these frivolous citations, but it gets worse. Law enforcement is also aggressively citing bystanders with criminal citations for obstructing traffic if they stop to observe or film a sweep. How do I know? Because this is footage of one such sweep where the observer was criminally cited for stopping to film the sweep. If there's an undeclared war against the homeless and those trying to support them, this is what it would look like. One thing that's very concerning to me is the new trend towards arresting and prosecuting people who are trying to help the homeless. We've seen a number of cases where people are there just to um, either try to provide services and get arrested or giving out water or filming the interaction, just witnessing what's going on. And for some reason, the Spokane Police Department has chosen, and the prosecutor's office, have chosen to make those into criminal offenses. Um, and one can ask the question of whether they are criminal offenses and whether there's probable cause, um, and those will be argued out in court. But the bigger question is why it's even in going that direction in the first place. You know, our law enforcement has massive discretion about when and whether to arrest somebody. They can see a jaywalker and decide not to cite that person because they got bigger things to focus on. Um, and they could deal with somebody who is in their way in many different ways. They could either ignore the person or ask them politely to move or, or whatever. Um, war warn them that next time they would be arrested. Um, but for some reason, there is a decision that's been made at a policy level that we're going to bring the force of the law down on people who aren't even doing anything that would normally be considered a crime because we want to um, make them stop doing that. It's a deterrent factor. The defenses are not so serious that it'll lend someone in prison, but it's enough to keep somebody from wanting to help again. Let's be blunt. The city of Spokane can order local law enforcement to conduct sweeps of the homeless from bridges, parks, and camps from now until hell freezes over, and it'll make no difference in the numbers of those experiencing homelessness that we've seen in this documentary. Sweeps won't change the reality of people experiencing homelessness having no place to go. And sweeps won't change the reality of having only 769 beds 
in the current citywide shelter system. Ongoing sweeps will simply perpetuate a cruel exercise, an ongoing game of homeless whack-a-mole, while providing a sad confirmation of the rubric that we don't want to solve homelessness, we just don't want to see it. I'd um, like them to get a job, but there's so many steps to getting a job that they could do if they got the job, but getting an outfit for, um, to look nice for the interview, how do you apply in the first place if it's only online? Where do you uh, get child care if you, if you need it or um, things like that? And so there's never going to be an easy one-size-fits-all solution because every single case is different. And what, what needs to happen is, is people who will invest the time to figuring out what, what explains that situation and what the solution is for that situation. It's never going to be, in my experience, that the person simply needs more motivation. If they're motivated by the fact that they're cold and they're hungry and they're sleeping outside and they're not safe and having a police officer come and make their lives worse is not the kick in the pants they needed to finally start taking action. They've had all the motivation they need. If anything, it just takes away what little bit of hope they may have had and motivation and provides one more barrier to have to overcome on top of everything else. Now there's a citation to deal with and a fine and a jail sentence and their, their stuff maybe got taken away and they're even farther behind. I don't want to see people sleeping on sidewalks or camping under bridges or in local parks either. But I want their absence to be the result of sufficient low barrier shelters and day centers with appropriate beds where they can go to find safety and stability, along with sufficient low barrier, low income housing they can move into when they're ready. But in the tightest housing market in a generation, there simply isn't sufficient housing and new affordable housing takes time to build. In the interim, sufficient low barrier shelters and beds are needed now as transitional places for those who have nowhere else to go. It shouldn't be this hard for us as a community to wrap our heads around this simple reality. Isn't it time to ask ourselves, is this the best we can do as a community to serve those in need? I believe the answer is no, because I believe we can do better. As we approach the conclusion of our journey through the night of the unsheltered homeless, I'm left with several unanswered questions. In our remaining time together, I want to address some of those questions and in the hope of jumpstarting a broader community conversation, I want to include some people sharing their perspectives on homelessness and homeless policy in Spokane. First question, what's changed about homelessness in recent years? Homeless service providers are near unanimous in the opinion that the number of homeless in Spokane has noticeably increased. But they're also seeing other changes among the homeless. I would say the other thing that has changed, and I've talked to many of the people who've been at this for years and years down here, they say the average homeless person who was an alcoholic and he stood on the corner and he could drink his way into being 70 years old, that, that homeless guy is kind of gone now. And what there is is a lot younger, a lot angrier, a lot more violent, anti-authoritarian, and a lot more addicted to opioids. It's a different population now. Given the growing and changing nature of homelessness in our city, what's been our city's response to homelessness? What you and I might call a homeless policy? If you were to ask me what our homeless response is, I would say I don't think we have a homeless response and that that's the problem. I don't think we have a unified system that the kind of thing that you might develop to really go after a problem you were seriously concerned about addressing. Um, we, we stay stuck in a debate over whether to do anything or whether services actually cause homelessness. You know, a lot of sort of bad ideas still drive our politics and keep us in lockstep. So I think there are individual things that, are, that, are, that have been um, really successful and done well. I think the permanent housing has put people into housing. Um, uh, the, the Catholic Charities Havens projects is permanent housing. I think those have been good for what they do. They're obviously not taking care of the whole problem. You know, I think Catholic Charities has done other good things, as have many other organizations that have um, done individual efforts, run shelters. Um, but I think that we don't have um, a single system, and and there's such a resistance to doing more, to doing enough sort of match the scale of the problem that we're really just trapped. 
you know, the irony is we're going through a political campaign right now where the, what I think of as the anti-homeless candidates um, are saying what they said last time and what they said the previous time and what they said the time before that, which is we can't keep doing the same thing. Well, we're not really doing the thing. We're, we've, we're stuck where we've been for years and years now while that street population has grown. If our city's response isn't matching the scale of the problem, why don't we as a city do more? Well, I wish I had a clearer answer to why we hadn't, but I, I think a huge part of it is that people don't think we should do something, that if we do something that we are enabling the problem. Um, this is a very common thing that I hear from uh, people who tend to just respond to homelessness as an issue of blight and quality of life, as an issue that affects them, not that affects the people on the street. And, and I think that, that, is a, that there's a very powerful uh, pull to, to believe that people should get what they deserve. And now cities, we're, we're grasping with that problem and that challenge, and that's where you see a real disconnect, where you, you hear people, whether they're advocates for people who are suffering or they're people who are businesses and neighborhoods, uh, uh, who are upset that their parks or sidewalks have been taken over. They're like, come on, city, do something. The city just doesn't have an infrastructure. We've got a, a fire and police, and we've got garbage pickup and water delivery. We've got all those services figured out, and we know how to pay for them. We don't know how to pay for homeless services or even housing uh, yet. Uh, I think to do it right, we do need to spend more. I'm always happy to see when we get grant funding, money from the feds, because that eliminates the political obstacle for people at City Hall. Um, if you're spending money that comes from the feds and you're David Condon or Nadine Woodward, it's a much more easy thing to get done than if you're asking them to support spending city money. So I'm always grateful to see that. It would be wrong to suggest that all of the city of Spokane's efforts to address regional homelessness aren't working. Some things are working. Well, the city in the time that I've been on council, which is well over five years, has now started to have shelters for some people. And so I would say that it's working for some people. We've evolved away from temporary uh, cold weather shelters, sometimes just a space on a gym floor, to actually 24-7 low barrier shelters, even co-ed shelters, even shelters with uh, you can bring your animal, who's your companion, so you don't have to choose between your companion and getting out of the weather. So we are doing that now. It's just that the scale is so small compared to the need. And so, so we, are, we are doing some good things and, and we're now starting to think about uh, regional partnerships that have just begun. I mean, the regional partnerships, uh, we're getting some money from the county for some things, but really all the services are in the city of Spokane and homelessness is a countywide problem. We are breaking new ground. The challenge is in order to make a real difference, you have to scale it up. But we are, I mean, just look back a few years ago, we did not have a year round Cannon Street shelter. We didn't have that. That is now year round, even with an administration that was against low barrier shelter. That is now a year round. We're just about to open the way out bridge shelter housing with wraparound services and where people can stay for 90 days, not just night by night, with services, getting them into housing. We have a new uh, Hope House that massively increased the number of women that are served, uh, again, with wraparound services and great rehousing. It's full every night, even though we just totally expanded it, I will tell you. Um, we've increased the family. Family Promise is now bigger. We have a new young adult shelter that's going online. Crosswalk is going to be expanded. Uh, so we are doing more things. There are more innovative things. The challenge is it feels like, compared to that problem, a drop in the bucket. The point that I would like to make is that what we're moving towards is homelessness being a public health issue and us having to address it. Just like the fire department, someone calls 911 with a medical emergency, they respond. They don't say, you know what, we only have so much money in our fire budget this year, so we're going to only go to every third call. They respond. And what local governments are realizing is that we're going to have to treat homelessness that way. 
And the reason is not just for the homeless person who's at risk of dying or having health negative outcomes and then going to the hospital and costing the hospital a lot of money, but the entire community pays a price when people are homeless. But when it comes to Spokane's homeless response, we also have to ask, what's not working? I would, I would say that th things that are not working right now is the idea that you could collect 200 people into a shelter and it's going to be okay because we're housing and feeding them and the behaviors will be fine. Well, that, that's not true if the, if the population is angrier, younger, more anti-authoritarian, more drug addicted. Right, so now smaller pockets of 20 to 30 maybe is a better strategy than trying to get 250 of them at one location all crammed together in one neighborhood in one location. The other thing is, and this has just sort of always been Spokane's reoccurring problem, which I've never fully understood. It always feels like every time the end of October rolls around, um, all the powers that be suddenly get surprised that it's cold outside and people are on the streets. We, we always know it's going to be cold, and we always know this is going to be the problem. And it always has felt like to me the last uh, 30 days from mid-October to mid-November, we're scrambling trying to meet that need. When we always know that need's coming every year, it hasn't changed, it always is. And then we stretch it out from whether it lasts till March or lasts till April. So just simply saving lives and putting people in shelters where they won't be dying in our alleys and in our streets seems to be this reoccurring surprise problem every year. It's time for us as a community to take a step back and to ask ourselves, what is the proper role of law enforcement and the courts in addressing homelessness? A lot of downtown property owners seem to see the proper role of the police as to do what they ask them to do. Um, I've, I've engaged with some of them who have reached out to me to say, I mentioned earlier, if I peed on the wall in Coeur d'Alene, I'd be in jail. Or let me tell you what I saw on my doorstep today. There was a drug addict out there openly using heroin, and he had junk around him. And when one of my employees asked him to move, he was rude to her. And so... That's frustrating. I get that that's frustrating, but the person who thinks the police are going to fix that. Now, maybe the police could move that guy. He's on private property. He might be trespassing um, unless he's sitting on the sidewalk. Maybe he's on the, you know, there are things that the police could do, but there's very little really that the police could do to achieve what he wants to achieve, which is to make that person not be there. Even if we could put people, take people to jail for that, we have an overcrowded jail right now that we're going into debt dealing with all these misdemeanor crimes that are mostly people going in and out, in and out, in and out. And even if we were putting people in jail for graffiti, for trespassing, for drug possession, they wouldn't be in there forever. And they come out with their ability to get out of homelessness, if they're interested in that, damaged worse than before. Now they've got to go to court to get back and forth to court. Now they're going to have financial obligations that they probably can't pay. Their ability to get a job is hampered. All of that. The idea that the police are a solution is a fantasy, but it is a, it is a deeply held one. But mostly my, mostly my concern with the police, with looking to the police to deal with homelessness is that it won't work. It will continue the suffering of people. It will continue to throw our resources down a hole. It will not do anything to help people get off the streets. It will just move them to another street if at the end of the day we don't have any place for them to go. And that's the baseline. We don't have any place for uh, them to go. And some are hard to help, but not all of them. Not all of those several thousand people want to sleep under the viaduct, and we're not giving them anywhere to go. Is this us? Does our city's current response to homelessness truly reflect who we are and who we want to be as a community? And when do we as a community get to express our views on such things as a lack of adequate shelter beds or mental health resources or PTSD veterans living under bridges or the homeless having nowhere to go to spend the day or access services? Wow. Um, you know, what's interesting to me is because I'm a pastor, I sit with groups of other church leaders and I'm in a group right now sponsored by Whitworth um, that sits with other pastors discussing how could we unite together and use our resources of people, time and money to help a major social problem in the city. And they wonder what to do. 
And in the meantime, I'm in another meeting um, where the mayor is speaking actually in our church for a different event that was a, a, a women's panel event. And she's saying, you know who's not showing up to, the, to deal with these problems? It's the, it's the faith community. Where's the faith community? I would love to talk to the faith community, she said. And uh, meanwhile, the business community is having a hard time talking to the frontline workers. And what's interesting, when I talk to everybody, we all agree what the answer is. We all agree that the answer is not people living in destitution and poverty and uh, filth and stuff on our streets in the cold, leaving needles and human waste. We all don't want that. We think what we want is people living in safe, clean shelters, managed and decent homes, getting their life back together and becoming a contributing member of society and not staying an addict. I don't care whether you're left or right. I don't care if you're a businessman or you're a social worker. We all agree that that's the goal. What we can't seem to do is sit down with each other and talk about how to achieve that goal um, because we climb the mountain from different sides. Is there a better path forward, better than the one we've seen and pursued up to this point? And how do we build a community vision that's bigger than ourselves and our particular agenda? A vision that's at least as big as the problem we're trying to solve? I believe there is a better path forward. I call it the better path of Shalom. Yeah, working together to build shalom, uh, and shalom being peace is what the literal translation is, but it's actually got multiple meanings of well-being, wholeness, completeness, um, happiness, joy, uh, everything works right. Um, we're trying to get to shalom. And for us who come out of a Christian background, I would even say Jewish background, because most of our shalom understanding is Old Testament, um, is that we would see it as, if you look back at when God was building that society, how many times the phrase, the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner occur. How the Old Testament uh, societies dealt with their widow, their foreigner, and the orphan. The three lowest level, most impoverished classes of people in society was how God judged that society. Whether it was right, or whether it was wicked, whether it was fair and just or not. How did you treat the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner? Um, and I think we're kind of there in modern era, sort of looking to that model of if God is judging us by that, how should we, how should we get to shalom? Shalom is an ancient Hebrew word with several meanings, depending on the context, including peace, welfare, healing, and restoration. In other words, shalom describes the way things ought to be, not only for our homeless friends, but also for our community as a whole. Unfortunately, what we've witnessed on this journey through unsheltered homelessness is widespread evidence of broken shalom. If genuine shalom is the way things ought to be, then our lack of adequate or appropriate shelter beds or allowing law enforcement to play whack-a-mole with the street homeless represents broken shalom, the way things ought not to be. Genuine shalom is about building right relationships rooted in peace and well-being for everyone involved that enable individuals and communities to thrive and to restore their lives to the way things ought to be. The idea of Shalom, uh, I of course love. I went to Whitworth University and I tell people, even though Whitworth is considered a little bit conservative, uh, theological, that I was from the Sermon on the Mount cohort of Whitworth students, which was, we are here on this earth to make a difference and resolve conflict and demonstrate our creator's affection and care for people uh, by demonstrating compassion to people and empathy to people. It doesn't matter who they are politically, economically, it's how do we bring people together. And that was my cause uh, when I went to Whitworth and probably one reason I chose it throughout those years and now it's been, you know, I graduated in 1985. So it's been a long time and I continue to do that work and I'm attracted to other people who do that work and I really see that's the only way forward is to bring people together and try not to stoke the fires of conflict but find common ground and compassion and empathy. At the end of the day we all get what we choose to pursue and we all get to live with what our choices create. That's true of us as individuals and it's as true for Spokane as a community as it is for every other community across America that's experiencing out-of-control homelessness. The present state of homelessness in Spokane 
represents the end product of what we as a community have chosen to pursue and create. It's impossible to choose chaos and to get cosmos, order, as a result. If we don't want to see people experiencing homelessness living in parks, under bridges, and in homeless camps, and being swept by law enforcement, then we as a community must make better choices. People experiencing homelessness live the way they do partly because we as a community have failed to provide them with reasonable, adequate, and appropriate alternatives. If our community homeless policy is broken, the fault is ours. To heal and restore the broken shalom of our homeless friends, as well as for our larger community, we need creative, innovative, and broad-based community solutions for a homeless policy built on a foundation of shalom. Anything less will doom us to failure and to having these same tired, worn-out discussion for years to come. How do I know? Because I've been doing this for 15 years, and very little has changed when compared with the size of the problem. And perhaps the reason so little has changed is because most of our solutions to homelessness reflect our understanding of poverty, the headwaters of the river of homelessness that flows through our community. Our community homeless policy is broken because our understanding of poverty is broken. So I went to school and I studied development and justice, got a graduate degree. And in the process of doing that, I, I, got a, I studied, well, poverty and homelessness and shalom and where it comes from. And the thing that just blew me away is how we misdefine poverty. We think of poverty as the absence of material resources. It's defined that way functionally in all of our programs. And even, I mean, ask anybody and they'll tell you, oh, it's not having money. It's not having money and stuff. You can look at, I can't remember, there, if you go online and search for videos, you can find all sorts of videos talking about poverty being the absence of stuff and money to buy stuff. But poverty is not primarily about the absence of material resources. So the assumption that we've made that it is about the absence of material resources, we've replaced the resources, but that's a symptom. It hasn't solved the problem. Just like with somebody who's homeless, someone experiencing homelessness, like you think that the problem is not having a home, but not having a home is a symptom of a deeper issue. And you have to look past the obvious symptoms to be able to deal with the root causes and a, a comprehensive or more robust definition of, shal of poverty is the absence of shalom characterized by broken and unjust relationships. If poverty and homelessness are about more than material resources provided as transactions, then our community solutions to homelessness cannot be a never ending stream of transactions. You need housing, we'll give you housing. You need food, we'll give you food. You need clothes, we'll provide you with clothes and our list of transactional solutions goes on and on year after year. Any community solution to homelessness must also be relational. Yes, there are transactional issues to be addressed, things such as food, clothing, housing, employment. But we must also address relational root issues by affirming the intrinsic worth of the person, helping them to rebuild lost community and to restore broken shalom. I think if you want to build a community defined by shalom, the foundation isn't how you treat people, but how you treat people is determined by how you see people. And if you recognize everybody has a story and every person has intrinsic value, it will change how you engage with them. It changes whether you see them as people or not. And I know that sounds crass and hard, but the bottom line is we, we dismiss people which diminishes the value that we have for them, and then it justifies how we treat people. As our journey through the night of the unsheltered homeless comes to an end, I want to challenge our vision moving forward. While Spokane debates the need for more shelter space, Mobile Loaves and Fishes, a faith-based nonprofit in Austin, Texas, is developing a 178-acre community for those emerging from chronic homelessness. Community First Village, is helping formerly homeless individuals to rebuild community and to restore broken shalom. They believe that the single greatest cause of homelessness is the catastrophic loss of family or community. 
Founded in 2015, it began as a 27-acre planned community, complete with a 100-space RV park, 130 microhomes, laundry, restroom, and shower facilities, a thriving community center, community kitchens, job training, employment opportunities, and much more. In April of 2021, Mobile O's and Fishes announced a major expansion to 178 acres, making space for an additional 1,400 microhomes, along with additional community amenities. They hope to be an example for other communities, like Spokane. You'll find more information about this amazing project on our documentary website at myroadleadshome.org. You owe it to yourself to take a look and embrace a bigger vision for how we as a community could address chronic homelessness. Maybe it's time to think about how we can rebuild lost community and restore the broken shalom of those experiencing homelessness. Why? Because as we rebuild their community, we rebuild our community. And as we restore their shalom, we restore our own shalom.
Hey, Marie, I have a question about yeah. one of the things that I really uh, resonated with me when you're talking about how small scale approaches are going to be more effective. It, I mean, at the meeting we had last night with a, an architect, he said that 50 people is like the ideal size. So, can you tell me more about what you see as be going forward as like food? I, I think that the speaker last night was correct. Um, you heard Rob Bryson. Rob's been at this for like 15 plus years. I mean, he started out downtown as a garden district. And he's been on the leadership team that's working on this building. And uh, you, you heard him say the idea that you can put 200 people in, in a big shelter and everything's got to be front door. Right now, the city's plan is for 800 bed shelters. And uh, the RFP request for proposal is circulating and nobody's responding. Well, it's overwhelming. To try and run something like that seems like so okay. daunting. So you hope well means a polite word. Um, <laughs> yeah. Stupid belief beyond belief is probably a little more accurate. I'm losing my filters in my way. <laughs> just, just so you know, more is coming to my head. Um, I've run, I've, I've run four of air shows. None of them over the size. They work well because that's mapping. You get to know people in the shelter. You get to discover the story and understand who they are, how they wound up. And so, as you saw at the opening uh, of this last week, by the way, this is uh, available by our website, myroadbeesome.org. You can watch the film. Again, if you missed a part of it, um, low barrier shelters work because it gets people all of it, off the street. Where they now know where they're going to sleep, where they're going to eat, where they're going to pee, and where they're going to be sick. And after about 30 days of being there, we start thinking about their evolution. It takes them about 30 days to realize they're not going to kick me out. <laughs> I, I do it. Uh, um, and, and so once that dawns on them, then they start asking questions. And I, I've had a conversation with a young man who comes to left my home. Or, and I'm going to get back to Florida. I've got that one. Yeah. So, um, we'll get you less of it. And we will. Actually, he, he had his own vehicle. We were raising money to buy gas, put him on the road, send him to Florida. Um, that's a solution. You can have no community here in New Orleans, and you have community in another state, you have family. And you can start rebuilding community, which is what you need to do. Common denominators of homelessness are deep personal trauma. For everybody, the trauma is different. Deep personal trauma and second of loss of community. That support network. Friends, family, church, social connections. You lost that community and now you're on your own. You're deeply traumatized. Guess where you have to wind up? Sleeping in your car in the park until you reach out, came down your car, and now you really are on the bridge. So anything that deals with trauma and restores the community to be if your plan to solve homelessness doesn't deal with trauma and community, dealing with trauma and restoring community, your plan is going to fail. I don't care how much you spend on it, I don't care how big it is, I don't care the experts you got involved. If you're not dealing with those two things, your plan is going to fail. Period. And right now, the city of Japan is to have an 800 bed facility. You're not going to deal with trauma, you're going to create more. If you if, if you thought the convention center was a train wreck, right. Right. you can't see nothing now. Unless you really enjoy train wrecks, in which case, buy a bigger bag of popcorn, sit back and watch it if it's going to be huge. Mm -hmm. The second. You could be arrested for the something that watched him. It's true, you're violating his life. Well, I just wanted to go back to Gordon's comment for a second about mm -hmm. the police. Um, and I neglected to introduce my friends here, Sarah Olson and Ron Hoxby, who are two <laughs> folks from New Hope who were on our housing and homelessness um, task force. Um, so welcome, you two. I'm sorry I forgot to introduce you. Um, when we, when our task force invited the deputy sheriff out to speak with us, it's been almost a year now, one of the things that he told us that absolutely infuriated me was that most of the homeless are anarchists. And so we've got attitudes yeah. within 
not just law enforcement, the entire community. And we need education and we need that attitude. Well, the other thing that she said that was so infuriating too was that our group was the first group that had contacted him looking to solve the problem. He said, oh, I've heard complaints. Like, oh, no, that wasn't him. That was the Kesselman, wasn't it? That was Jeff Curtin. Jeff Curtin, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Was county commissioner. County commissioner, thank you. Yeah, and he said, no beef from out here has contacted me. Concerned about the problem. That's something that needs to be solved. Um, first, people don't know what to do. How do you solve the problem? Um, but it's easy to complain. I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room has a file, a file an official complaint about something that's not a file. You didn't know how to solve the problem. You did not have a file. <laughs> and, and I've done it. And, um, so it, it's much easier to complain about a problem than it is to come up with solutions for a problem. Secondly, um, <laughs> tell people, I, since I started making documentaries three years ago, the tone that I wanted to set is a tone of building a shalom. Think of the word. Um, it's about peace, wholeness, well-being, restoration. It's very deep, broad, and good. Um, poorly understood. When Jesus said, "Blessed are the peacemakers," because he was speaking in Aramaic, and I agree for he would. What the disciple literally heard was, "Blessed are the shalom." That's what they heard. That's the message. How do we become shalomers? So when it comes to homelessness. What can what can we do to build a shalom of the homes? That's the question we need to be asking. So we need to change the tone of the community discussion about homes. It's very us versus them. It's you know, like this business group that wants to try and read and overturn Martin versus Boise, um, which said you can't punish people for existing. Um, how do we get rid of that so we can start squeezing people? We're, we're now we're back to a war on the homes. That's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're going to wait war against these people, and we're going to use the police to do it. We're going to sweep them up. We're going to throw them all. They're either going to jail, or they're going to go to the shelter. And we really don't care what happens either in jail or in the shelter, as long as we don't have to see it. Why can't we be a part of it? That's the that's attitude. And so, one of the things we've got to do is we've got to change that attitude. So I'm meeting with some business groups tomorrow morning. Um, I won't get into who, um, but the reason exchanging emails and stuff will be for tomorrow. And I'm going to, one of the things we want to do in our documentary work is shift from the things that you've seen today, which is a lot of problem pointing out, there's issue. We want to move from issues to solutions. How do we hide a solution? People who are doing good work so that people can step up and say, you know, I saw that piece that you did, that we did a piece of you, um, a couple years ago called The Dignity of a Child runs 14 minutes, and it's just about a shower show, and giving showers to one. We put it out, and wound up on the other side of the state, and got a call from a group of polls that says, I, I, I mentioned this last week, they said, we, we saw your piece, we showed it to our, the board of our nonprofit, and as a result, they have made a decision, we're going to do this over here now. So what you're doing is you're changing the tone of the discussion and you're giving people practical ideas. How can we do that? How can we make a difference? That's just, that's just one example. We need to be doing more of that. Right now the business community has a lot of complaints for no solution. Well, we did a study. Politicians are always doing studies. People who don't know what they're doing always do studies. Been doing this 15 years. You don't need a study. What you need is smaller shelters. You need to change the tone of the discussion. And you need community involvement. You don't need a study. You need community involvement. And you need to get out of us versus them, those nasty, dirty, dangerous homes. You gotta get out. And it will never solve or meaningfully address homelessness in Spokane until it um, is. Harriet asked me. And the email you know, get back to, you know, what can the average person do? Good question. Um, four years ago, I put together a book called 30 Days and 30 Ways of Doing Good. It's available on Amazon. I checked the for make sure it's still there. Um, 30 Days and 30 Ways of Doing Good. And what I did was, among the Toy Homeless Collision, 
I have to do a 30 day guide. It's kind of saying you can read one, one chapter a day. And it's, here's an issue, here's some people who are doing something about it, you can in touch with them, and then here's kind of, I call it a reflection of the little kind of devotion bar. And the idea was read until you find something that clicks with you. And in the back of the resource guide, a lot of the nonprofits that are here in the world. Um, I'm going to propose to this business group that we do something like this or revise it and update it. We need to be giving people practical ideas for how they can get involved so that homeless, marginalized, hungry, and the ripple effects are profound. Um, so we need practical ideas. So that's one of the things we're going to try and challenge them on. Let's get out of this. We need to do a study. We need to get out of your office and do something. We need to get involved. So but other than that, I know we're, we're over time. Um, I will hang around and I'll be the last man standing. Um, so, <laughs> where we want to hang around, so I'll, I'll, I'll be here. So, what's your definition of a low barrier shelter? Low. And if one of the people who is staying there comes from staying outside and he's created or intoxicated or just and it's disruptive, what do you do? Uh, my favorite story. <laughs> First, I, I think I shot me out. I'm sorry. Okay. I said, I got someone shot now. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Aaron Johnson, I'll never forget. Um, he came in by, uh, actually, it, it, it kind of grew as we as checking. We just turned the four by four board and tried to take it away from him. He started manifesting, and I had to gently move him toward the door and out of the shelter. And he was saying, I, I had volunteered for my was first trips. And uh, he was hanging around the cars, the volunteers. So I, I called 911. I said, Look, well, I need him to move out. He's gonna have, we're going to have a problem. It is, he's threatening people. So 10 minutes later, we're in the shelter, finishing check in, and all of a sudden I heard, ah, 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 ah. Oh, no. And all the guys are going, That's Yeah. He had a knife and he went towards the police and he wouldn't put it down. He kept advancing on it. Wouldn't put it down, wouldn't put it in a shot. Fortunately, our police are terrible shots. <laughs> they shot him seven times, too. Thank God. Um, so these are the kind of things that. And not every shelter director has stories like that, and I wish I didn't have it because I'm awake at three o'clock in the morning wondering what it is. That's what it's like to run into People often with with bipolar disorder, disorder and schizophrenia and others are homeless. Yeah. And they get into crises. And we don't have the mental health resources. No, we don't. For, so and that was that was Aaron. That's part of the big problem too, then that it's yeah. Making more problems for everyone else. He's gotten off his medications. His parents had a restraining order against him. Right. Yeah. And, well, and so it was a train wreck in progress. It just happened to wreck in my shelter. Right. That night. And someone where in another shelter the same night. But then another. Yeah. You, uh, yeah, you know, what do you do if somebody comes in integrated? And, and my, my answer, my response is as long as they're not violent, they're okay. Right. I had a fellow come in and everybody told me, don't. This guy could be dangerous. And supposedly he was a, Navy, a former Navy SEAL, and he looked he was built like one. <laughs> and I saved him for last, and he was intoxicated. He was sitting there, and I came up to him. And they said, Well, I want to give you a bed, but if you're a problem, you won't do it. Am I going to have a problem with you? And he just looked and said, No, sir, I'll be fine. So I got him, got him checked in, sat him down on the bed, taking his shoes off. And uh, I'm trying to put it to bed. I'm talking to him. He looks at me. Can I just get a hug? This <laughs> <laughs> guy stands up and he grabs me, pulls me, and pulls me up. I thought he was you know, crushing the wind out of me. He just wanted to hug me. And I don't know if that was because he was drunk or whatever. But it just kind of reveals the humanity of. The people that you're working with. Um, and he was fine that night. The staff said he got up once and moved to the restroom. Woke up about six o'clock in the morning, didn't know where he was. 
and, and left and then never heard from him again. I don't know where he is, what we say. So low barrier means you let people like that unless they're final. And one of the problems that we're having right now is, is fentanyl and and uh, heroin are being mixed in mixed blue pills. They're extremely dangerous. And uh, as a result, we're getting people going off in the shelters for no reason other than they're either they're most likely they're coming out of this stuff and they just tweet just like that. You know, they go and pass it to violence. And so I've talked with some of the shelter directors and they're very concerned about it. They don't want to not be a low barrier shelter, but now it's just more challenging than it's ever, ever been. The low barrier means you let them in. You let them in. Why? Because you may be the last resort for them. And I want to be the one who said no. Anyway. Hey, Maurice, I want to say thank you very much for coming. This has been a fabulous.